Okay, for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about um, the peak of the Middle Ages, which is a period of time that, that scholars call the High Middle Ages. Um, this was a time of a lot of innovation, a lot of change within uh, medieval Europe, and so um, it actually precedes a quite disastrous period of time in European history, but all of these events and all of these circumstances and all of these developments are going to lead up to the Renaissance. So we it's really important to get a good understanding of the context of this time period because it helps to understand the later Renaissance and the developments that occurred in that time period as well. Okay, a key, co a key component of understanding this time period is understanding how social or social organization worked, how society was organized, and how it was how classes were divided. Um, and we have a couple of sources from the time period that give us an idea of at least how people um, who were contemporary to this time period understood social organization. The first passage that I'm going to quote to you was, was by a man, uh, a bishop named Adalbero of Leon, and he wrote, Here below some pray, others fight, still others work. Another passage that we find from this time period, which, which is around the beginning of the 11th century, I should mention, uh, was written by Gerard of Cambrai. Uh, he wrote, From the beginning, mankind has been divided into three parts, among men of prayer, farmers, and men of war. It's really interesting. Um, scholars now talk about these as the three orders. Um, and the pyramid that you can see uh, lays out how this worked. Now, the image of a tripartite society divided by function has become a hallmark of medieval European history, and I think that understanding this tripartite, tripartite division of European society that occurred during the High Middle Ages is really important both for our understanding of medieval European history, but also for the subsequent history of the continent. So, for example, uh, it's going to help us to understand the developments during the Black Plague and the Renaissance, and even into um, the 18th century. Uh, in particular, we will see this come into play during the French Revolution. If you decide to take Western Civilizations to the second semester, you will see how important this theory of social organization figures in that conflict. It was during it, it was during that century, the 18th century, that that the Ancien Régime, which roughly translates to the Old Regime, faced its gravest challenge during during the days of the French Revolution. One of the first things the revolutionaries abolished was feudalism. Uh, and feudalism, I use that term loosely because there really is no, no uniform system of feudalism in Europe, but scholars will talk about it as, as a way of having organized society. And we, and, and I do believe we've already discussed that, um, in our week during which we, we spoke about the Carolingians. Um, so as as these revolutionaries abolished feudalism, they also were attempting to abolish the remnants of a society that was based on status and prestige. This is a society that was based on the division of orders according to one's function, those who work, those who fight, and those who pray. And you can see from the pyramid um, that those who pray would have been the clergy, and they were responsible for praying for the community. Each of these roles has an integral role in, in preserving the stability of society. And so for the clergy, that meant that they prayed for the spiritual well-being. They prayed for God's favor. Um, they prayed for the protection of their communities. In, in times of conflict, they prayed that, that God would save them and so on and so forth. Uh, there were lots of reasons to pray, but they had an integral role in, in preserving the spiritual well-being of the community. And then we have those who fight, the Bellatoris. Uh, these would be the, the nobility. Um, and it was their responsibility to protect the community. And you can see that as European society was becoming increasingly violent, why this would be such an important role to play. Um, because people needed to be protected. And so there's, there's really an important role for the nobility in protecting society by fighting wars by defending communities, defending lands, 
Um, and then the third, the third uh, division of society were the were the laboratores, um, and these are Latin terms. In in case you um, were wondering, but these are the people who work, and we know them as the peasants. This this is the peasant class of people, and it was approximately eight, eighty percent of the population that supported all of society, and so it was their job to provide for food and goods. Um, and so that was their that was their contribution to the stability of society. And each of these each of these three divisions, the these people, the theory went that everybody had their role to play. And when everybody worked together and did what they were supposed to do, what what God had meant for them to do, then society would function well, and there would be peace and prosperity. Okay, so um, we're going to focus this week primarily on um, the, cur the commercial, urban, and agricultural revolutions, as well as changes in, um, in education. We're going to see the development of um, a much more sophisticated university system and the development of scholasticism. So that's primarily what we're going to focus on this week. Uh, as Europe entered the new millennium, so we're talking in the 11th century, at the beginning of the 11th century, um, it, it experienced, Europe experienced a quickening of trade, innovation, agriculture, artistic and literary achievement, and, and really much, much more. There are important factors that contributed to this growth, and these factors were in turn driven, driving each other. So, for example, uh, this is a time period that experienced better climate conditions, and those good climate conditions led to more availability of food. Lots, lots more crops were being produced. Uh, with more food, uh, there was population growth, and that in turn drove the need for, for agricultural innovations that could accommodate the growing of more food. So we see the development of a three-field system. We see new irrigation methods. We see the development of the heavy plow, which allowed um, more land that was previously unavailable to be farmed. With a heavy plow, they could plow up those, those soils that were too heavy to plow by hand. And so this led to an increase in, in the availability of arable land. And as agricultural got more efficient and more effective, this led to more food and so forth. And so we see that more food led to population growth. More population growth led to the need for more food. Uh, and we see innovation all wrapped up in this. And this is just an example of how that worked. And, and this we see this in many different aspects of European society, that we see this cycle of need and innovation. Um, there are some consequences to this. This, particularly when we're talking about agriculture and these innovations in agriculture and this this um, higher availability of food, but also population pressure, and some of those consequences were that we had higher food prices in Europe. We also have a decline in serfdom. Um, we see much less serfdom. We see the 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 linkages. Um, we see how people were tied to the land. Those ties are being severed, and so people are becoming more mobile. Now, we also see the development of new commercial centers. Markets were associated with particular places, and these, places, these markets were used for regular weekly meetings to sell goods. This was common practice. We also see fairs. Uh, fairs were often specialized, and they could last days or even weeks. <clears throat> and they drew traders from longer distances and took place once a year. So this was... This could be an annual thing or a biannual thing, and, and it was broadcast about that there would be this fair. And so you would have traders show up to participate in that. And so this is further, further driving uh, a greater commercialization of Europe. Um, through taxes and tolls on merchants, fairs produce substantial revenues for towns. And so what we see happening is the development of these permanent commercial centers in towns and cities. Um, and they often, they often developed around castles or monasteries. So these are, these are towns that are building around places that are already seen as social centers, as, as places of public gathering. 
As great lords in the countryside increasingly accepted money payments instead of services and dues from their peasants, they also had more money available to foster the development of markets and fairs. This further encouraged trade and settlement in these areas. And so we see the development of these large urban areas um, being driven by the need for a place to trade. So, um, you know, I like to include some discussion about um, minority groups, for example, the Jews. Um, many long-distance traders were Italians and Jews. Italians and Jews were very involved in long-distance trade, and they, they often mediated that. They supplied things like fine wine, spices, and fabrics that weren't produced in, in Europe. Italians took up these trades because of the geographic opportunities and urbanization that was occurring throughout Europe. Some Mediterranean Jews had been involved in commerce since Roman times. Jews in Northern Europe uh, were often driven off their land, however, as political power fragmented. This meant that they relocated to towns or cities where some became money lenders and f financiers. Uh, Jews in cities often had an ambiguous status. They were not recognized as citizens, and they were often excluded from oath-based Christian craft organizations or the government. They had their own institutions and synagogues, and they often lived voluntarily segregated in a Jewish quarter. Uh, they participated in a shared economy with Christians as consumers, traders, and money lenders, which is really interesting because we do start to see we do see some divisions that are, are beginning to occur between Christians and, and uh, Jewish populations. Um, but those, those divisions aren't happening overnight. They're developing over time. But during this period of time, we do see an integral role for Jewish populations in European society. <clears throat> now, many marketplace towns were actually unplanned. And they just, they just happened. Um, and they included marketplaces, often a castle and several churches. Remember, a castle was really important to, to the defense of a community. Population, in turn, increased dramatically, as we've already discussed. Uh, an accompanying building boom provided greater housing in these urban areas. And we also see specialized buildings for trade and city government. And we see expanded walls in some of these towns. Uh, networks of often narrow and dark streets were made of parked clay or gravel. These weren't the greatest roads, but they were still better than, than rut, rutted, muddy roads. Um, and we see waterways being used as well. And waterways actually accelerated the development of towns and became part of a single interdependent economy. They became very important for transportation of goods. Um, especially because road situations could be a little bit tenuous. So those, those urban centers that were located on rivers benefited the most from these developments in, in new networks of trade. So this is a really, this is really a great map, and it shows some of those, those uh, tr trade routes that, develop, that were developing in this time period throughout Europe. Um, so these are, you can see from the map that, that this is, these are trade routes from the 11th and 12th centuries. Um, and we see land trade routes. They would be the ones in, uh, from my screen, it looks a little pink, a little fuchsia. Um, but we also see water trade routes. Those would be the routes in blue. Um, and so you can see how, you can see how being connected to to water in some way or, or having some kind of proximity to a water route had had some significance for the development of these urban centers. The further inland you get, um, you know, for example, up into uh, what's now Eastern Germany, Poland, um, some of these areas, while they did still have trade going on, it's not as condensed. It, it's not as urbanized. Um, and so that has significance. Um, so just, you know, it's an interesting map and gives you an idea of where that trade is occurring and how important trade was to the development of these urban centers. Okay, and, and so this is just, this is an example of a community and, and what, what that might have looked like. So this is the, these are the walls of Piazza, Piazza um, in Italy. 
This would have been a commune, um, and we're going to talk about communes a bit. Um, but you can see that this community had had pockets of tradesmen and craftsmen um, in these areas, and so you, what you tended to have developing is these little these little sub communities um, that were dedicated to a particular component of trade, some kind of craft. Um, and so in the orange, you can see these different pockets of textile makers. And in the green, you can see that there were smiths, so blacksmiths. Um, and I would suspect that you would see wheelwrights and, and um, people of those types of trades in these areas as well. And then in the blue, you have leather workers. The interesting thing about this is that you can see that the leather workers are kind of off a little bit by themselves. It wouldn't have been a great thing to live around um, those who practiced the trade of leatherworking because the 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 um, the process was a really smelly one and it, it was really kind of nasty to be around um, and so you shouldn't be surprised to see that they were a little bit um, off to the side in some of these areas um, certainly anybody who lived around those areas were probably these are probably going to be the poorer classes you're not going to see anybody from the aristocracy or the nobility or even the clergy living around um, these particular tradesmen um, and then in yellow you can see fishermen kiln workers and shipwrights and and as you would expect they, they would be located closer to the river. So it's just an interesting uh, way of looking at how society was structured in this particular community and very much driven by um, occupation. All right. So there was a, a really important uh, form of organization in medieval society called the guilds. And you may already have heard of guilds. We're going to talk about these a little bit. Uh, medieval industry was was really highly organized, principally through guilds. These were a kind of club for crafts and tradespeople, and so they would be organized around a particular type of occupation. You would have a guild, especially for the practitioners of that occupation. These were originally religious or charitable associations. They were a way of coming together and supporting one another, and they they evolved into professional corporations with statutes, rules, and dues that set standards within a trade and controlled membership. And so uh, at times they could even they could even become so organized and so tightly controlling of a, of a particular industry that they somewhat monopolized um, that industry as a guild. Um, they would set prices and determine quality of goods, things like that. Guilds often cooperated in making goods, and they were hierarchical, with masters and journeymen supervising apprentices. Uh, masters set guild policies, and they served as officers. Now, this might be familiar to some of you who are perhaps in a trade-oriented course of study, because um, these are this is still a form of organization that we see in some of the in many of the trades. Um, a new a new range of business agreements brought people and resources together to finance larger commercial initiatives and these efforts were actually the ancestors of modern day capitalism contracts for sales exchanges and loans became much more common <clears throat> we also see that church bans on interest or usury led to contracts designed to circumvent them the use of loans to finance businesses signaled a changed attitude toward credit. Risk was acceptable if it brought profit. This is a new, this is a change in the way that people think about trade. The growth of contracts and partnerships made large scale productive enterprises easier to establish and finance. So this is in turn furthering, it's, um, it's continuing to promote growth. Light industry began in the 11th century, centering on cloth production. So we see a lot of, we see some centers throughout Europe that are focused very much on cloth production. For example, uh, England became known for its, its uh, production of wool, wool cloth. Water mills provided some power and deep mining technology also allowed for more exploitation of raw materials. And we also see that the manufacture of iron tools made farming more efficient. So all around, we see lots of innovation occurring that is 
that is spurring growth in trade and commerce. So life in, in a medieval city probably wasn't the most comfortable uh, existence that you could possibly have. Um, most medieval cities were surrounded by stone walls and they were really prone to fire. Fire was a very common thing. Uh, most buildings, while some buildings would have been stone, most buildings would have been built of wood and with with everybody um, burning fires in their homes and what little light people had being provided by um, you know forms of fire, this meant that that cities experienced a lot of fire. Um, it was also a place that had a lot of artisans and a lot of trade, and and so this was a center of production. Um, water could often be really kind of disgusting. It was heavily polluted um, because any of those any of those remains of manufacturing would have been dumped into water supplies. They, these are cities that didn't have great sanitation systems, um, and so you there was sewage, lots of sewage in the streets. Trash was often dumped in the streets. Like I said, this was this was not a great existence. It wasn't the most pleasant place. Cities in this time period were were often described as being really smelly, and um, so as you can imagine, these would have been uh, centers of you know quite a bit of disease. So fire, disease, filth, uh, lots of dirt, lots of pollution. Um, it was really kind of gross. Um, and on top of that, people, when they did bathe, they tended to do so in public baths. Um, but you can imagine that for, for some societies, there wasn't a lot of bathing going on. This wasn't, it was, this wasn't something that you did every, every night before you went to bed. So, um, like I said, it could be rather unpleasant. Um, now, what we see happening with the development of the medieval, of these medieval, medieval urban centers, this is going to change the, this, this threefold social division that I've talked about in the beginning, those who pray, those who fight, and those who worked. Because urban dwellers with their specialized occupations don't fit as neatly into those, those old categories. And in fact, townspeople developed a real sense of solidarity, a real sense of community identity, and they had particular economic and political needs. Townspeople had a sense of independence uh, from servile dues and service, and they sought their own officials and law courts. So we see a lot of innovation in legal codes that are occurring during, during this time period. Um, communes, <clears throat> these were town institutions of self-government. <clears throat> they actually developed as legal corporate bodies so that towns could govern themselves. Now, communes were most common in Italy, France, and Flanders. This is where you're going to see um, this is where you're going to see communes mostly centered. In Italy, cities were centers of political activity and were filled with tradespeople that were interested in self-governance. Urban independence movements were sometimes really violent, but many towns gained a measure of self-rule. And so we will often see these towns, uh, there will be some citizenship, citizenship status that goes along with it, and, and there would be resident, residential requirements that went along with it. So you would have to have lived in a place for a certain amount of time before you were eligible to be a citizen of a commune. So it's just really interesting development in the political and social structure of these towns. There's not anything like it. We, we haven't seen anything like this. This is a new development. Now, by 1150, rural life was increasingly organized around the marketplace, as we've seen. This brought new opportunities and obligations to both peasants and lords. As economic pressures on the rural aristocracy increased, this meant that the aristocracy sought to increase their wealth and prestige by becoming integrated into the commercial economy. So instead of relying on those old sources of income, we're going to see the aristocracy starting to move into these more commercial interests. Lords hired trained literate agents to administer their estates, 
And these these agents often were put to work calculating profits and losses and making marketing decisions. Population increase and rising demand for food led to efforts to cultivate new land, particularly in Flanders. Most of these efforts were sponsored by the nobility, but sometimes, as in England's Fenland region, free, free peasants worked to reclaim land on their own. Some peasants banded together and established rural communes. Um, integration into a money economy benefited peasants in a number of ways. Rising prices made their fixed rents less onerous, and better access to markets allowed them to sell their surplus production for cash, which they could then spend on other goods. In some cases, peasants also gained personal freedom from their lords. However, cash obligations also increased. So just as with everything, there's a pro and a con to every new development. Now for peasants, um, life Life was determined by the seasons, and so the bulk of the work was done during warm periods, and during the winter, this was, was a period of, of relative downtime. Um, the calendar revolved around religious feast days and the church, and so we see that a lot of, a lot of peasants ha actually had a lot of time off for feast days, because feast days, you didn't do work on those days. And so social life revolved around the church for many peasants. Um, most peasants lived in wooden cottages. They lived rather simple lifestyles with rather simple diets. Um, but what's interesting about their diet is that it very much relied on, you know, a little, uh, you know, the few sources of meat that they were able to get, maybe a pig, uh, maybe, maybe a sheep. Um, there, there wasn't a lot of access to cattle, and that probably would have been reserved for, for people who were wealthier. But you might be able to raise a pig. You, um, oftentimes what would happen is that peasants would have sort of some common woods and would uh, allow pigs to, to um, subsist on whatever they could find in the, wo in the woods. And then when fall came, you would butcher the pig. Um, so that was a common thing. Um, Peasants didn't eat a lot of a lot of butter or dairy products. Those were usually sold at market because they they brought good money um, into the household. Um, but but peasants also gathered a lot. They grew foods, and so they had a diet that was very reliant on uh, vegetable products. So a lot of beans, some cheaper grains. Um, probably not wheat, but maybe barley would have been something that that a peasant ate. Um, peasants ate a lot. They ate uh, bread. Bread was a key component of their diet as well. And so, what's interesting about this is that if you were wealthy, you could, of course, afford a lot of meat. It was seen as a status, um, a status symbol, being able to have a diet rich in meat. But this also led to some nutritional difficulties. And so, we see a lot of gout among the wealthy. It's kind of interesting. So, in reality. Uh, peasants probably had a more uh, healthier diet than the nobility. The nobility often had some really, um, uh, they had some d difficult uh, health concerns that were brought on by diets that were rich in, in meat and fats. Um, but peasants, if they got enough food, were probably eating very good food. Um, but that was the question. Could they get enough food? So when peasants had a difficult time getting, um, getting a good diet, it was because they lacked, they lacked sufficient food, not necessarily that they lacked good food. Um, they also drank a lot. Um, I, when I was a graduate student, I took a, I took a course in, uh, popular religions. And popular religions is this, this idea that in, in Europe, um, the way that that most people practice their religion could very often differ from the formal practice of a religion, and so we see a lot of in in popular religions we see a lot of mixture of um, you know maybe maybe forms of worship that have roots in a pagan past intermixed with these more formal rituals of the church. Um, but part of this course we talked quite a bit about daily lives of peasants and. Um, I remember reading an article that stated that for most oh, that this particular had this particular scholar, and I apologize for not having the name of that scholar in front of me, but this particular scholar um, 
sort of, you know, took took information that he could find from the documentary evidence and put it together and came to the conclusion that most people, most of their lives, walked around in a state of drunkenness because they drank so much alcohol. As I discussed a little bit earlier in, in the development of towns, because water became so polluted, it was really an unsafe it was unsafe to to drink water for the most part and so even if you drank water you always put alcohol in it first um, to sterilize the water to make it safe to drink but on top of that alcohol was a really efficient way to store grains um, and not have to worry about spoilage not have to worry about rodents getting into your grain and so uh, grains were often stored in the form of alcohol and so people drank a lot um, and even children would have been, they would have um, been exposed to very watered down quantities of alcohol as a result of this. Now, the lives of women, you know, per, in, in, in family life, uh, as I said, peasants would have lived in, in wooden cottages for the most part. And these cottages meant that for most peasants, they had limited privacy. Um, you know, my kids, I, I remember when we, we moved into our second home, it was a bigger home than we'd been living in, and there was some argument over who was going to get what room, and and I, um, I it was just really interesting to see them kind of wrestle over which room was the biggest and, and all of that, and some of you may have had similar similar experiences with your own children, or maybe this was your experience as a teenager as well. But for most peasants, a privacy was a non-issue because you just didn't have any. Um, families slept in the same room that they lived in. And oftentimes they shared that room with, they could possibly share that room with some livestock as well. So it, this was a really interesting existence. Now for women, you know, as we've seen that that for for most women, depending on your class, um, if you were lower class, you tended to be more involved in economic activities. For the most part, um, for for peasant women, their their contribution to the household in terms of its economics was really vital to the family survival. They they didn't just bear children and manage household households, but they were also working in the fields with their husbands. Um, this was a very different lifestyle from aristocratic women. Aristocratic women remained largely under the control of men um, for all of their lives, but they were not quite as oppressed as you might think. Uh, there are numerous examples of women, of women from these classes who exercise considerable power and influence, and some of those examples your book is giving you would be Eleanor of Aquitaine and Blanche of Castile. And so some scholars have kind of modified the way that they uh, talk about and analyze uh, the life of women during these time periods because they they really did have a little they did really exert a, a more influence than we've become accustomed to thinking about women from the past. Okay, so um, among the aristocracy, we have some interesting developments, and and I'm not going to go too much into this, but. You know, we have, um, even among the aristocracy, we have divisions of status. So we have a hierarchy among the aristocracy. And you'll notice from this list, so we have kings, which tended to be at the top, of course, that how much control a king had over his, uh, his society varied. For example, in France, we're going to see that uh, the French king didn't have a lot of power and influence. He really was a weak king. But in England the king was rather strong um, and had more centralized power over over his people a lot more control over over what occurred in his kingdom um, and then we have some other divisions dukes counts barons viscounts um, and notice that we have bishops and archbishops included. These were offices, these were positions within the church. But we count them as the aristocracy because they often came from the aristocracy. These were positions of prestige. And so we see the aristocracy, there, there are some a lot of ties between the aristocracy and the upper echelons of the church. Um, and so we include these these offices because they were they were such prestigious offices to hold. Um, now, as you would expect, the aristocracy had 
a lot of land and they exerted a lot of power in in the various areas that throughout Europe um, land was power um, this is going to change of course as as commerce and trade become increasingly important but the most successful or the most successful members of the aristocracy are going to be those who can adapt who can use their land and tie it to means of production um, and more efficient production we also see the aristocracy developing this warrior culture and so what I mean by the warrior culture is that we see this development of of chivalry which was a code of ethics for the nobility it was a way of being a way of behaving violence got so bad during during the Middle Ages localized violence became so extreme and so life could be a little bit tenuous um, and in response to this uh, we see the development of this code of ethics called chivalry um, in what's going on here is that we see um, a lot of knights we have a lot of young knights so you if you were the son of a nobleman or even just a wealthy landowner you could become a knight but if there wasn't a lot going on if there weren't a lot of wars to fight um, then you really didn't have much to do this as things became more prosperous and this was a time period of peace there were a lot of young knights that didn't have a lot to do and this meant increased violence um, because what happens when teenage boys or even men in their 20s and and I apologize to anybody who might be offended by this but whenever you have these large groups of young men who who aren't occupied with something um, we see in the middle in the the Middle Ages that there were these outbreaks of violence and oftentimes peasants um, were affected by this they they were essentially in the way in in the wrong place at the wrong time and so they they could be victimized by this so there was a lot of violence and so as a result we see the development of chivalry this code of ethics that dictated honor virtue things like that and this was epitomized you can see in the stories of King Arthur these became very popular stories and Sir Lancelot was the epitome of this of this code of ethics we also see the development of tournaments as a way of diverting some of these young men into maybe some more productive expressions of their athleticism I suppose is what you could call it um, so this is kind of developing in response to what is still essentially a warrior culture but it's a warrior culture that doesn't that doesn't really have the avenues to express itself in the same way because life is changing things are different um, and so it's just a, it's it's just becoming different life in Europe is changing and and people are having to change with it and so in response to that Europeans are seeing a need to control some of these violent tendencies so um, we actually have some interesting developments in terms of learning that are occurring during this time as well uh, we have some early universities that that are founded during this time period and these are universities that are still prestigious today the first university uh, was founded in Bologna in in uh, what we know of today is Italy and its focus was primarily law it was founded around 1158 and so if you wanted to study the law and you have the you have the resources to do so the place to be was Bologna you would go to the university there and studying law there meant that you were pretty well set the next important university that we see um, in this time period is the University of Paris which was founded around 1200 we also see Oxford and Cambridge um, founded Oxford was founded in 1208 Cambridge um, in 1209 so um, it's kind of interesting that we see the development of these new universities that are still that figure so prominently even still today um, this this medieval learning uh, these new developments in medieval learning is driven by a revival of classical antiquity there's a revival of interest in the work of the Greeks and the Romans remember in previous in previous chapters we've read that knowledge that religious knowledge was privileged over some of these ancient these ancient forms of knowledge and so they became very unpopular but during the Middle Ages during the high Middle Ages people are rediscovering the classics um, 
And they're also rediscovering the Greek scientists and Greek philosophy. Um, and it's interesting to note, um, a lot of people aren't aware of this, but this is very much, um, it, it would not have been possible without the contributions of Islamic scholars. It's interesting um, to note that in our current political climate, we have certain ideas um, that some people hold about Islam. But what's really unfortunate about this is that it denies the history of Islam. Um, Islam Islamic scholars are really important. We've, we've talked about um, the Abbasids and their importance in developing this, this culture of toleration in Spain, in what we know of today as Spain, that really fostered intellectual thought, the development of art, science, medicine, lots of these different areas. And in turn, what what Islam what Islamic scholars in Spain as well as in what we know of today of as the Middle East, they were also preserving some of these Greek sources of thought and some of these Roman sources of thought that had fallen out of favor. And because of that, in combination with some of the monasteries that had also worked to preserve these sources, these, these sources are, are, are available to be rediscovered. And so we have a lot to be grateful to, um, to be great, to be grateful for, to, um, to Islamic history, because it was really fundamental to driving these new innovations. And really, without this time period, without this rediscovery of, of these classics, the Renaissance wouldn't have happened. The scientific revolution wouldn't have happened. The Age of Enlightenment wouldn't happen. We would not be who we are today. So I want to point that out to you, that that's a really important thing to consider. Um, now, monastery and cathedral schools had a very long history. By the end of the 11th century in some cities, schools developed reputations for particular approaches or specialization in theology, literature, or law. Many students were willing to pay to hear lectures from the best teacher, and lecture is a term that really means to read from the Latin. Using the common language of Latin, students could drift from school to school throughout Europe, stopping wherever a noted master was teaching. This was a really popular thing to do. And we're going to see this uh, with Abelard. Abelard becomes Peter Abelard, becomes a really popular teacher, and, and really draws a lot of young people to him because of his popularity. Courses of study focused on the seven liberal arts, which included the trivium, the trivium was grammar, rhetoric, and logic, and the quadrivium, which was arithmetic, geometry, music theater, and theory, music theory, and astronomy. So you would start with the trivium, and if you wanted to pursue more advanced courses of study, you could go into the quadrivium. And then, if you wanted to, you could go even further than that and specialize. But many saw, many saw um, logic as the most ideal um, course of study. Uh, many saw it as a discipline that would bring order and clarity to other issues. And remember, these, these people are coming out of a time of violence, and so order and clarity would have been really appealing to them. The study of medicine, theology, and law prepared students for jobs. So you could always go into advanced degrees where you would specialize in these areas, and, and there, were, there were jobs avail available for people who wanted to do those things. This led to a remarkable renewal of scholarship and learning, um, lots of experimentation, lots of inquiry going on. This is a really important time period for the development of the university system. And even, even here in the United States, there are a lot of roots. Our universities and colleges have a lot of roots in the medieval system. When you graduate, the ceremony, the commencement ceremony, what you wear, how commencement occurs, has a lot of roots in the medieval past. And if you ever get a chance to kind of look up the meaning of the different forms of clothing that you wear based on the degree that you have attained, it's really quite interesting to see how that worked. Um, so to just, let's talk about Peter Abelard now. Peter Abelard, um, he was one of the Middle Ages' greatest thinkers. He came from a wealthier family, but he renounced both his inheritance and he, he also dabbled a little bit in 
uh, becoming a soldier, but he renounced um, he renounced his inheritance and he renounced the soldier's lifestyle to become a student and then a teacher. And he was well known for his critical thinking. His works, Sikh et Non, juxtaposed authoritative sources on both sides of important questions. He was really known for this, for being able to consider all sides of a question. Um, and think about that, because oftentimes we get so, um, we become so firm in our own way of thinking that we fail to consider uh, what another pe person might think. But Abelard really revolutionized this, this approach to solving problems, of being able to think it through from all sides. Now, Abelard became a private tutor for a, a woman named Heloise. She was from a higher class than him. She came from a noble family. And she was actually the niece of a Parisian cleric named Foubert. And in the process of becoming her tutor, he actually became her lover. They, they began an affair, and she became pregnant as a result. And when she became pregnant, they were secretly married. Now, why is this a problem, you ask? Well, during this time period, for teachers, it, there was there was some of the same expectations for teachers as there was there was for the clergy, and so the ideal teacher lived a celibate life, and so this would have been a scandal of monumental proportions for him to have had this affair, gotten this this girl pregnant, and then to have married her, but. Even though they were secretly married, Fulbert was no dummy, and he suspected he suspected that there was something going on. He had Abelard castrated, and Abelard and Heloise wound up entering separate monasteries. And so what we have from Abelard and Heloise is we have a series of letters that is written between them, and these are really a terrific source of information about, about a particular culture. Um, and so this is just a really kind of a tragic story, although uh, Abelard and Heloise both, Heloise in particular, rose to prominence within her convent. She became, she became the abbess of the convent, and so she became very important in that convent and achieved some success there. Um, but their letters back and forth are really, really kind of heartbreaking to one another. So if you ever get the opportunity to read some of those, you should definitely do so. Abelard's writings about the Trinity. Um, this is these are the this is the Catholic this is the Catholic notion of the nature of God the Father, of God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, his writings about the Trinity were condemned by the Cal Council of Soissons in in 1121. And what's interesting about this time period is he thought of that as his masterwork. And you can see in the letters that he's written to Heloise, you know, they've undergone, they've they've experienced this great tragedy of of having found love but being separated for the rest of their lives. Um, neither one of them raised their son. He he was raised by another family member of, of Heloise. And so they, their family is separated. And, you know, for most of us, that would be just a terrible tragedy. And to Heloise, it was. Abelard, there, there's this really interesting exchange between them. He's written this letter and has talked about how this is the greatest tragedy of his life, that, that his masterwork was actually burned by authorities and and he was um, he was vilified by many members of the clergy for his views on the Trinity and you see this remarkable response from Heloise in which she is chastising him she's chastising him because she remi is reminding him that that she loves him and and they've had this tragedy in which they can't be together but she's reminding him that she loves him and it's just really a remarkable story. Um, we have a man also named Peter the Chanter. Uh, he died around 1197. We don't know when he was born, but he was an influential master of scholars whose lectures and commentary focused on biblical texts. So unlike most theology masters, Peter commented on all books of the Bible, and he also disputed the text, drawing on the logic of Aristotle to describe other explanations and refute them. He also offered popular sermons. He was another one of these very popular teachers. So the important thing to remember about the development of universities is that these began as guilds. Um, we've already discussed guilds, but they developed their own rules and regulations with apprentices and masters. And so their apprentices would have been students, and their masters were teachers. Students were disciplined, tested, and housed at the university. 
and different universities had different characters and specialties, and the curriculum varied as well. Masters and students were considered to be clerics, and this barred women from joining. The special privileges of universities actually made them virtually self-governing corporations, and this sometimes led to friction with their respective towns, and you can read more about that in your book. Okay, so now on to the development of scholasticism. Scholasticism used logical inquiry in, a, in an attempt to summarize and reconcile all knowledge. This is what, what you should remember about scholasticism. Scholastics in the universities were confident that knowledge from the senses and reason was compatible with knowledge obtained through faith and revolution. So this is really driven by the need to merge uh, faith and knowledge together. Um, scholastic knowledge would produce effective preaching and conversion. This is a really interesting development. The method made confident use of Aristotle's rules, interestingly enough, um, and liked to incorporate logic. It often investigated the natural world as well. One of the most famous um, practitioners of scholasticism would have been Thomas Aquinas, and you might have heard of him. He was the most famous scholastic. He was a Neapolitan Dominican who was a master at the University of Paris. He published the monumental Summa Theologica in 1273, which intended to cover all important topics. Thomas Aquinas really strived to be the best. The topics were divided into questions, many of which spoke to practical concerns of the day, such as whether or not it was lawful to sell something for more than it was worth. This is a really interesting question that, that people still grapple with today. Scholasticism was enormously optimistic and offered a sense of purpose and order as well as a guide to behavior. It, it however, did not always provide unity, and later scholastics such as, as John Dunn Scotus, uh, who, who lived primarily during the thir latter, latter half of the 13th century and early 14th century, uh, he was a Franciscan who taught at Oxford and Paris, and he, like other scholastics of his time period, concerned themselves with the limits of reason. Dun Scotus found the world and God to be less compatible. He believed illumination came not as a matter of course, but only when God chose to intervene. So just to change course a little bit, we're going to talk about the, the growth of a vernacular high culture and the, the development of these troubadours. Um, by the beginning of the 12th century, um, we have uh, some significant influence by Arab and Hebrew love poetry occurring, um, and this is going to have an impact on lyric poetry. Troubadours began performing dazzling and originally in original songs in verse in Occitan. This was the language of southern France. The meters were borrowed from Latin religious poetry, so that's a really interesting synthesis of different different art forms. But troubadour songs were usually about love. Whatever the theme, the songs celebrated the power and influence of women and were particularly patronized by aristocratic women. Troubadour poetry spread from southern France throughout Europe via Italy, northern France, England, and Germany with other vernacular languages imitating the style. So this is a great example of of a troubadour song called I Never Died for Love and so there's a translation there you can read it um, just just to give you an idea of what it looked like and so you can see from the music that it is a little bit different in the way that it's written from from the way that we write music today okay so as it, we've already discussed um, we have some changes in in the role of the wire throughout Europe um, and this is having an impact on the development of culture um, cult means of, of expression um, in in Europe and so narrative epic poems about war appeared around the same time in Europe throughout Europe and what's going on is that as knights lost their military importance to mercenary soldiers so um, it, the idea of maintaining knights, of a noble maintaining a set of knights as a defensive force is on the decline at the same time that nobles are recognizing that they can just hire mercenaries instead and it's much cheaper. Um, and this means that knights 
are losing their influence relative to merchants and increasingly powerful lords. They they increasingly desired a code of conduct. We've talked about this, that, that they developed this code of conduct that we know of today as chivalry. And the idea behind this is that it would set them apart and it would provide solidarity and a knightly ethos. So epic war poems explored themes of contradictory values, including friendship, vassalage, and competing loyalties. Some epic poems emphasized romantic themes as well, with many focusing on the court of King Arthur. Lancelot of King Arthur's court embodied the principles of chivalry that the poems focused on. Chivalry cons constrained warriors through its code of refinement, fair play, piety, and idealistic devotion. And so today we tend to think of chivalry as the expression of good manners. Um, but it, it, it was more than that during this time period. This was a way of living and this was a lifestyle. Now another thing that is occurring during this time period is we're getting we're getting we're seeing new architectural styles and and the two most prominent um the two best examples of architectural styles that we see developing is the romanesque style and the gothic style and these are two very different styles of architecture and so um I'm going to show you some examples of that in some upcoming slides but first I want to kind of talk about what those what those styles look like. So Romanesque church buildings were rather heavy, serious, and solid. This this was the image that they imbued. They they had massive stone walls and interiors decorated with wall paintings. Different parts of the church functioned as discrete units. Plain chant, plain chant uh, we know this today um, as Gregorian chant. Uh, you might have heard some Gregorian chants. Plain chant melodies were sung in unison and rhythmically free. They worked well in large Romanesque churches with cavernous choirs. They sounded just really, really good. Romanesque churches also had elaborate reliquaries and altars, and these were considered the appropriate accoutrements of worship in Romanesque churches. Monks and priests who, who benefited from the gift economy offered prayers to God in the most splendid of settings. These are really elaborate um, buildings. Now we have Gothic churches emerging in cities around the 12th century to the 15th centuries, and these really reflected the wealth and self-confidence of merchants, guilds, people, bishops, kings. Gothic churches were usually cathedrals, and they were characterized by pointed arches and features designed to invoke heaven. So the idea was you would go into a Gothic cathedral and you would be immediately transported to a more heavenly um, setting. Um, some of the features that you'll see in Gothic style, Gothic style architecture is ribbed vaulting, flying buttresses. They were, these were an innovation that allowed uh, structures to be built taller and bigger, as well as large rose windows. The Gothic style began with a man named uh, Suger. He was an abbot. And he uh, sought to rebuild portions of the church at Saint-Denis in France around 1135. And in doing so, developed this, this new style of architecture. Gothic exteriors were opaque, bristling, and forbidding, while the interior invoked light, harmony, and order. This was the idea. With regional variations, the style spread across Europe. It became very popular. And so just in case you didn't know it, um, many Romanesque churches and even many and many uh, Gothic cathedrals took on this, this floor plan that was designed around, around the cross. Um, it, some people don't necessarily, you don't necessarily immediately key into that when you walk into some of these buildings, but this was a very common floor plan. For the Byzantines, um, the, the arms would have been more equal, but they too oftentimes uh, had were the floor plan was in the shape of a cross. Just really interesting. And this is some uh, just a breakdown of some of the features of Gothic architecture. You can see the flying buttress. What this did was it provided the the roof load to be spread um, through these flying buttresses so that the walls didn't have to be so massive. This really freed up. Uh, architecture to include more windows um, and and be able to bring in more light into the interiors. This was really important innovation. And this is 
This is just kind of a breakdown of some of the more Romanesque features. You can see how different it is in character. It's a really, really solid structure. And so um, I want to give you some examples of what some of these buildings look like because you should um, become familiar with what these style of architectures look like. And, and you can tell by looking at them what they are. So just take a moment and see if you can decide based on those descriptions of Romanesque versus Gothic architecture <clears throat> whether you think that this one is is Gothic or Romanesque and this might actually be a familiar structure to you so um, if you hadn't already guessed this is the Duomo di Pisa this is the cathedral at Pisa uh, you might have spotted the familiar bell tower in the background, the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Um, maybe, maybe some of you didn't realize this, but this is actually part of a cathedral complex. Um, and so the bell tower is not really the most significant part of Pisa. It's just the most famous uh, of the, the cathedral complex at Pisa. Um, and so we have this very, very solid looking structure. Um, so if you hadn't already guessed, it, it was Romanesque. The construction of Pisa Cathedral um, began around 1063 under the architect Buschetto. This man was also the founder of the distinctive Pisan Romanesque style in which the cathedral is built. So this building went on to inspire other architects and other buildings. The cathedral is also inspired by several ar other architectural styles. By looking at the four rows of open gallery above the entrance, you can find several smaller round arches, which is a typical feature in Moorish architecture. This is interesting. The inside also shows signs of Byzantine influences, especially the beautiful mosaic. As Pisa was a strong naval power, historians believe that these influences were brought into the city by different travelers and sailors. So this was a cosmopolitan city. The cathedral is and was, at the time of its construction, one of the most impressive cathedrals in the world. There is no coincidence that this, it is no coincidence that this beautiful cathedral is located in Pisa, as Pisa used to be one of the most powerful cities in the Mediterranean area. The cathedral itself is actually dedicated to St. Mary of the Assumption, if, if you didn't know that. Okay, so here's an ex another example of a cathedral, and so just take a moment and see if you can guess uh, what style of architecture this one is, is following. Okay, so this is actually Notre Dame in Paris. If, um, this might be familiar to you, although uh, the, the, the view from the standing in front of the two bell towers at the back, that might be more familiar to you, but this is Notre Dame. Um, it was designed in the Gothic fashion and built between the 12th and 14th centuries. It is the official seat of the Archbishop of Paris. Its architecture is one of the first examples of the use of flying buttresses, and the cathedral also features numerous statues and stained glass windows. It is very ornate. Major components that make Notre Dame unique include one of the world's largest organs and its immense church bells, two bell towers, and there are, if you look closely, you can see a lot of bells in those towers. The Bishop of Paris was a, a, a man named Maurice de Sully. He ordered the construction of Notre Dame in 1160. He deemed the church that already stood in that location unworthy of the prestige of his position. He really felt that he deserved more. Actual construction started a few years later when the foundation stone was laid in 1163. The choir uh, was the first portion of the building to be completed, and it was consecrated in 1177. The high altar was finished a few late years later in 1182. However, Maurice de Sully died in 1196 while the cathedral was still being built. It was not yet finished. Construction continued for years, with many bishops and architects making their mark on the seemingly never-ending building process. The fact that so many people had a part in building Notre Dame is what accounts for its unique and varied design. It wasn't until 1345 that the cathedral was consecrated as complete. So it took quite a bit of time, almost 200 years from, from the time that the archbishop decided that it needed to be built. 
All right, here's another one, and I want you to take a look at this and see if you can you can decide what what form of architecture this one is. So aside from being one of the uh, most important examples of Gothic architecture in Italy, one of the main characteristics of this cathedral is the presence of thousands of spires. I it this is this is ornate and it is often described as wedding cake architecture. The cathedral has about 135 spires, each mounted with a statue depicting important people in Milan's history and different characters in the Bible. The highest spire and the tallest spire of the cathedral measures up to 357 feet tall and holds the most important symbol of Milan, which was the Madonnina, or Little Madonna. It's actually a golden statue that is so important that by law, no any other building should pass the height of it. It took five centuries to complete this cathedral, from 1386 until the 19th century, when Napoleon Bonaparte ordered, to, uh, ordered the completion of the cathedral's facade. You can just imagine... Um, all of the many European artists that were involved in this project and participated in doing it. There, there are a lot of different hands in this pie. There are thousands of statues inside the cathedral and there are so many beautiful stained glasses and relics. This is a really famous example of Gothic architecture. You might notice, however, that the Duomo of Milano is missing something. Remember Notre Dame and its bell towers? You don't see one. In, in Milan. It doesn't have one. Okay, so here's another one, and I want you to take a look at it. Just take a moment um, and see if you can decide uh, what its influences are. Okay, so this, this one's kind of tricky. It's actually a trick question. Um, I, I put this one on here because it's an example of how a structure could actually have numerous influences and so you can see from this it, it looks very Romanesque in many areas and it actually started out as being a more Romanesque style building but um, it took so long to complete and um, you know in the middle of its construction Gothic architecture was just taking it was just storming Europe and so uh, the construction kind of changed course a bit um, and so some of the examples, I, this is, it looks very Romanesque, very solid, uh, especially from the side. You can see more Romanesque elements, rounded arches, lots of pillars. But from the front, you can see that there's been some change. This is a different facade. It's a different material. And so they actually put this facade on. And you can see the Gothic arches. You can also see the really ornate porch um, that is very Gothic in nature. Um, this is actually Ferrar Cathedral. Um, in the Italian, it's the Basilica Cathedrale. Sorry, I, I don't speak Italian, so I'll try to get through this. But it's the Basilica Cathedrale di San Giorgio. It's a basilica in Ferrara, which is in northern Italy, and it's the largest religious building in that city. It's actually dedicated to St. George, who is the patron saint of Ferrara. This basilica was begun in the 12th century when the city was extending towards the left bank of the Po River. The former cathedral was also dedicated to St. George and it still stands on the right bank of the river. This, this particular building was dedicated and consecrated in 1135, so it didn't quite take as long as some of these other buildings that we've seen. Ferrara is a good example of how taste could change over time. You can see, you can see from the front and side views the Romanesque features, and you can see the Gothic elements. But in addition to that, the bell tower that you can see at the back of the building is actually more Renaissance style. This this was a style of architecture that we see in the Renaissance. A lot of pink and per, uh, pink and white marble. It's um, more pastels. And in the 19th century, on top of that. Uh, there was a fire that destroyed the interior of this building, so it was redone in the Baroque style. So there's a lot of stuff going on in this particular building. And so I hope you got a feel for what architecture was looking like in that time period and um, enjoyed this section on the Middle Ages.